Welcome back to the podcast daily on a Monday. It's Doug Maurice and Bill Landis, Berm and Austin working their way back from New Jersey. So this is how we do it on Monday when Berm is on the road. We're going to run through some texter stuff, Landis. We have one Michigan question at the end, a Jordan Hancock question, an injury question, a uh, question about Ohio State being number one, if they still will be in the college football playoff rankings on Tuesday. We'll actually get more into that on the uh, Kings of the North show later on Monday. But let's start with this, which is I like questions that make us think. This is John in L.A. I feel like this was one of those games, meaning Ohio State's win over Rutgers on Saturday, that the urban teams would have lost. For instance, I mean, we know the two references there, right? It's like 27, 2017 Iowa, 2018 Purdue. I feel more encouraged by the weathering the storm aspect of this game. Not happy with the outcome, but content. So if you look at it as like, hey, could have been a loss. It's a great way to look at a win. Could have been a loss. <laughs> what do you think? I I, I get that. I, I think there's I think this conversation has come up a few times during Ryan Day's tenure because uh, it is a quality of and they show the graphic every time. Yeah, they do. Why I say it's playing somebody like Ryan Day doesn't lose these games. Right. Um, and it's not like Urban Meyer lost them regularly. He just lost two of them in embarrassing fashion that the whole country remembers. Um, so it's worth bringing up. And, and as an Ohio State fan, those are the things that kind of stick in, stick in your memory, unfortunately, even with all the good stuff that happened. Um, so I get that. Like, I, I, I don't know. Like, never did I think that this game was, like, sort of teetering on the brink of that. Like, uh, you know, the Rucker or not the Rutgers, the Iowa game in 17 and the Purdue game in 18. Like, Ohio State couldn't stop either of those teams right. was like this is this is getting out of hand and out of hand quickly and there were like some weird things happening in those games um i never really thought that Rutgers was going to win i was just kind of waiting for ohio state to kick into the gear and they, and they eventually did so i don't know that i would i would consider this game uh in that same light but but i do think generally there's probably something worth um I don't know, savoring, being excited about, keeping in the back of your mind that like, yeah, like Ryan Day typically figures out a way to win games like this, and that's good. Ryan Day is a, is a guy who loves offense, who still, you know, kind of asked him last week, hey, you know, you're kind of getting used to winning in a different way. He was like, we still want to score every time. We still want to score 40, 40 points a game, which they have done. They're just not doing it this year. Um, there are some, for the millionth time, some Trestle-esque tendencies of this particular Ohio State team. I think when it comes to winning ugly, I do think the thing we have to keep in mind is, and and this has come up, I think it's it is um, a truism of these games that Ohio State has lost that the other underdog team usually has an NFL dude who can be a game wrecker, right? Mm -hmm. And so Rondell Moore was that at receiver for Purdue in 2018. Josh Jackson was that at cornerback for Iowa. In addition to Noah Fant and TJ Hawkinson at tight end, they had three NFL guys who were game wreckers in that Iowa game. When we go back to like the 2009 Purdue game back in the day, right? That's Ryan Kerrigan wrecking that game. Rutgers didn't have that. Like Kamanung guy's good. Muhammad Ture, right, had a great pick, but he's still like he was on our all north midseason team, but not quite, or maybe didn't have the opportunity to wreck games like that. We talked about get to year five of Gavin Wimsett as a quarterback, and maybe you get there. So I do think there was also a part of it if if Kyle Manung guy was a future first round pick, they might have cashed in on a couple of those red zone trips where they were held to field goals right. because there would have been a player like where well, they hide, they hand it to common on guy. There's nothing there. And he breaks three tackles and spins off a guy and scores anyway. And mm -hmm. if that would have happened, the game would have been different. So I think Ohio state deserves some credit. I also think they got lucky. Rutgers didn't quite have a dude who could make them pay. Yeah. And, and will Rutgers ever like, who, who knows? I think uh, if they ever will, it's, it's probably year five version of, of Gavin Wimsett, but they don't have that now. And, I, I did think in in the games we're talking about and this sort of is it I guess a different way of saying what you just said like the other teams were doing things to Ohio State yeah. and and this game was just like Ohio State sort of not getting out of its own way until it did and then pulled away Rutgers offered Saquon Barkley before anybody did right like mm -hmm. the, the, the day where it's like oh what if they would have like that guy who is none because that happens sometimes right now sometimes in the portal era it's gonna th that guy's gonna leave a program like Rutgers and go somewhere else but anyway I, I do think it's a point well taken I think it is a point that Ohio State fans it's worth taking to heart 
because you cannot go through life taking every win for granted and letting every loss ruin your month. That's no way to live. So Rutgers is good enough, good enough to not completely blow off the win and be like, oh, God, who cares? Everybody beats Rutgers. No, they don't. Everybody doesn't beat Rutgers right now. But it's kind of good they didn't have Rondell Moore. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Number two. This is from our guy, Pat. After the McCord pod that you and I did and Ryan Day saying that they needed to not put Kyle in bad spots, I thought the game would look like this with lots of short, quick plays at the expense of Marvin Harrison Jr. Get out of Kyle's hands. The question is, can they win against the big boys with that strategy? I think not, Pat says. What, what do we think of where they are on trying to make this offense work right now versus man like does that beat bama well i don't maybe this will sound a little silly based off what we've seen the last couple of weeks but i think as long as you have this kind of talent at the skill positions then yes you can you can figure out a way i think to get into a, a track meet if a game turned into that I, you know, the, the another question to ask if we're having this conversation is, will Ohio State get into a game like that? Like, will this defense allow it to? But I know that's not that's not the spirit of the question. So we'll stick with the offense. Um, no, let's let's let the spirit of the question guide us a little bit. We, we're yeah. not going to do an hour, which we yeah. could yeah. on this topic. But after watching Saturday, primarily the two games that the whole world had on simultaneously, which is Jaden mm -hmm. Daniels of LSU versus Jalen Miller of Alabama and Caleb Williams of USC versus Michael Penix of Washington, and then thinking about a world where Ohio State played this defensive juggernaut in the semifinals last year, and it, the Georgia-Ohio State game was first one to 50. Didn't you watch college football Saturday night and think to yourself, can Ohio State win a shootout against the big boys if they need to? Yeah. Did you think I, that? I've thought that a few times this year. Yeah. Yeah. I for felt sure. it Saturday more than I ever felt it at any point. Pro probably. I think I think that's right. Um, I think you can maybe even throw the Georgia game in there a little bit too, because that was I was getting a little pointsy at a point and then and then they, Georgia kind of pulled away from Missouri. Um so like yes or no, do I think they could do that right now? I I would probably lean toward no. I don't I don't know. I don't know that I've seen enough at the quarterback position to think that they could get quite to that level. And this is all this is then leads to the like the working it out discussion, right? Mm -hmm. Which is okay, you're trying to get Kyle McCord comfortable, or you're trying to make sure that you have a quarterback who doesn't make mistakes that you can't afford for the quarterback to make. Okay, let's focus on that first. Ohio State, boom, 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 boom. His A dot yesterday, average depth of target. We were talking a little bit about it on the post game show. It was the lowest of the season for him uh, by far. So, like, that is a little different. Yesterday, his uh, A dot of 7.6 was, like, 48th in the Power 5 yesterday, right? Like, mm -hmm. all these 69 teams are playing Power 5 football. It was pretty low. So, like, for instance, uh, the Penn State. So, average at the targets, how, how far does the ball travel in the air, right? And normally, like, you're up in the 10s. He was, Kyle's been up in the tens, at least the nines for most of the game. 7.6, like CJ didn't have a game as low as a 7.6 A dot all of last year. He did have one in 2021, which is a fair conversation for Kyle. So anyway, we were talking about it. Like, was it going to be lower because he's taking check downs and that kind of thing? Yes. Now, again, like your A dot on the pass to Trivia and Henderson is like six. And then he runs it another 60 yards himself and it's a big gigantic play so it's not the end of the world yeah but all right here's i'm putting all my cards on the table let's see it i got like a four and a seven and a nine <laughs> but i'm pushing in that's how i roll do i look like a, do, I, do i have a good poker face no you need sunglasses yeah so we did the whole podcast and um you know, I, I don't think like, again, it's, it's not bad quarterback play or whatever, but when I watch the quarterback playmaking and I understand that Kyle McCord has an injured ankle, but he did not, again, this is by PFF. He did not make a big time throw yesterday and he also didn't scramble at all. So the combination and, and the, and the same thing against Penn state. Now, like they're not expecting you're not expected to have like 10 big time throws a game. But like if you're feeling it as a quarterback, you might have three or four, maybe five. CJ had some games with five. Right. And and 
you know, unplanned runs for a quarterback. You're not supposed to have 10 scrambles a game in a normal offense like this, but you could have two or three. That would be normal, okay? So I think arguably maybe the two best defenses they face, Penn State and Rutgers, both those games he had zero big-time throws and zero scrambles. And so then I start thinking about quarterback playmaking because you could watch those other four quarterbacks we started off the, the, the discussion with, and they are making plays, and I'm not expecting – Kyle McCord to run like Jaden Daniels. But if you're not going to make it with your legs and you're also not going to make it with your arms and you're trying to win a national championship, I would think that's a concern. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. There's, there's a, it's just, yeah, it's playmaking. Right. And, and it was a question I think we had with CJ Stroud too, until he finally did it against Georgia. Um, he usually had more big, like he would have more big time throws. He was oh, doing he, it with yeah, his yeah, arm and in, sure. in a world yeah. where a lot of people wanted to do it more with his legs, but he was usually always doing it with his arm. Yeah. Um, I, so the, the, the two games we're talking about, like in comparison, I, I guess I just want to make this point. Alabama's 40th in the country in passing defense. Al, LSU is 81st. USC and Washington are like 120 and 125. They're bad defenses against the pass. Alabama less so, but like three of those defenses are terrible. Um, so I don't know. Maybe Kyle McCord can do that in a game like that against those teams because they're not very good. And it's one of those things like I, along with everybody else in the country, did a little tweet about how Northwestern and Iowa had 100 combined yards and no points in the first half yesterday. And Washington and USC had 600 yards and 60 points. And they're going to be in the same conference that year. That is not a one-way tweet, right? That yeah. is not a USC and Washington are doing it right and Northwestern and Iowa are doing it wrong. It's, it's mostly that, but it's not only that. So the, some of these teams, they're going to they're gonna have to figure it out when they face better defenses. But I still wonder about that. I, I left yesterday, all those things being true, I left yesterday wondering about the playmaking at the position for Ohio State. Now you've got, he did not make the mistake like he made against Wisconsin. So that was progress. Mm -hmm. But now there has to be like a next step in the progress. Take away the mistakes, but now you do have to get back to adding something from him where he's going to rip a throw in a big spot or do something off, off structure, out of pocket that's unexpected. You have to do a, Ryan Day's favorite play of the season last year was CJ Stroud breaking the sack against Georgia and throwing the touchdown pass to Marvin Harrison Jr. He could yeah. not control his body. That I think Ryan Day, this program, Kyle McCord himself, you'd like to see a player two like that in the next two weeks. Yes. You yes, you would. Um, I guess I would say like and then the Notre Dame game, I think it was not quite that. Like it wasn't like scrambling around making plays, but he was like hanging in the pocket, making some tough throws. Yes. Notre Dame currently has a number two pass defense in the country, and they played some good teams. Big time so, throw. There's no bigger time throw than the third and nineteen throw. No bigger time throw in college football this season. It's a pretty big throw. Yeah, I might put I might put Michael Penix or Roma Dunze at the end of that game up there, but so we could do that. We could do that. Best throws of the North. We yeah, could do that later on Monday. Yeah. But like, so it, it's not that you've never seen it. It's not. We're not saying that. We're saying that I think like the last drive against Notre Dame, you saw that. And it's like, you need to see that again. Cause it mm -hmm. felt like we haven't seen that version of Kyle McCord as much in the last month and a half yeah. as we did on that drive. Mm -hmm. What was the question? <laughs> Can they win with quick Kyle? So let's answer the question. Uh, do they need more playmaking from Kyle McCord in big games to win the national title? I think so. Yeah, I, th I don't. I don't think they need to put it all on his back. No. But I think they need, yeah, more than what we've seen. I, I did a lot of. Uh, I got a whole lot of stats here, but it feels like it doesn't. I think we've made <clears> our <throat> point. Yeah. Sometimes I just, if you write something in a notebook, does that mean you should say it on a podcast? Let me say this. The scramble part of it, you're not expecting him to scramble a ton. According to PFF, he scrambled eight times on 280 dropbacks. Michael Penix has four scrambles, right? So he's not last. But just by comparison, right? Drake May leads the country with 40 scrambles. Jaden Daniels of LSU has 39. Jalen Milrow has 33. Caleb Williams at USC has 20. Jackson Dart at Ole Miss has 19. Quinn Ewers at Texas has 18. Jordan Travis at Florida State has 17. 
Carson Beck at Georgia has 17. Sam Hartman at Notre Dame has 16. Drew Aller at Penn State has 14. Bo Nix at Oregon has 13. So you're not saying that you're waiting for Kyle McCord to run all over the place, right? Mm. But, and this is like, like I never thought C.J. Stroud should run because I always said the minute he passes the line of scrimmage, he's less dangerous than he is behind the line of scrimmage. Kyle right now is not at that point as a, the, as a passer that C.J. was. So then it's like, where's the danger come from? I think he could run a scooch more once or twice more per game, right? I, that, that's all. Yeah. Just have it, make the defense think about it a little bit more if you're not going to be standing in there diagnosing it and ripping it, which also he has not done against the best defenses since Notre Dame. That's all. Right. One of the two. Yes? They, okay, yeah. fair? I, I think that's fair. And the other thing, too, it's not, it was the same thing with me for CJ. It was not merely a running conversation. It was a play extension conversation. Like, that. I don't... How many... I don't know anyone who tracks this. Maybe like Sports Info Solutions or somebody tracks it. But it's like off the top of your head, like how many second reaction pass completions does Ohio State have this year where Kyle McCord had to get outside of the pocket, reset, and it got into a scramble drill, and then he completed the ball down the field to somebody? I can't think of one. I can't think of one. When I think of that, although it was a planned rollout even on the pick against Wisconsin, but that's like not part of what they do right now. Mm Mm-hmm. So if you're not going to really have that in the offense, then you better have a quarterback whose brain is a computer. Yeah. Or yeah. Dwayne Haskins didn't do it a ton, but it was out, 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 out. Which is sort of what we're getting to with, you know, could you win? Like, again, it's like, can you win with Kyle getting rid of the ball quickly? I don't know if it looks like 2018, maybe. Yeah, I think you I think you can if he's getting the ball out quickly to like Marvin and Emeka and not to yeah. G. Scott. No offense. No, that's fair. Yeah. yeah. And like like the Travion checkdowns are great. You're getting it to a playmaker. But like other than the gigantic one, they didn't work a ton. You know, like they they kind of no, were just they're, like. They're like three and four yards time. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that was worth doing that. We're going to get a little quicker on the rest of this stuff. This is from Brian. There were a few plays with the two back set against Rutgers, what's the thoughts on this approach to the running game moving forward? Not many, though, because I I looked at the PFF snaps for everybody, right? And like uh, Trevion had 47 and Chip had 10. Mm-hmm. So that's 57 combined. And they only had 54 offensive plays, so they couldn't have had more than a handful of plays, right? What, so specifically and theoretically, two back. Yeah, I have it all. This this is what I do. I want to show if you're watching on YouTube. Oh. This is my notepad. This is every Your single handwriting op- is beautiful. It's every single offensive play. I do it every week. I drive myself crazy. Uh, they ran it four times. Um, okay. And like it was fine. I guess it's it's a nice uh, wrinkle. I like the fact that when they do do that stuff, and it's not dissimilar from what they did with Mitch Rossi, it's just more threatening because I think Chip has a little more to him than Mitch Rossi did. Um, but in this game, I think they ran it four times for five yards. Um one was like a four yard gain. There was a loss in there and another like one yard gain. I think that the one play that I think I liked the most out of that look was the was it fourth and one or third and one. I think it was third and one late in the game. They got into that look and they handed it off to chip instead of having chip block for Travion and chip got like two yards and a first down. Um, so that was nice. So I, I, I don't I don't mind it. Um, I still unless you're doing a quarterback sneak, I just don't. And we saw it on the one yard run from Travion. I don't I don't think this offensive line is equipped to like get that push that you want to see on those types of plays. So I don't, I don't want to see it too much, but I don't mind it as an occasional wrinkle, I guess. This is from Randy. How much did the injuries to the defensive backfield enable Rutgers to have success running the ball? I think having Sonny styles play the deep safety takes him away from being able to help stuff the run. Also not having Denzel Burke in there, uh, affects things. And it probably, um, you know, just some, some other things that maybe weren't as good as usual, um, sort of like I think the most specific thing there is like you you're not having Sonny in the box as often. D- did you think yeah. that was a big part of this? Uh, could could have been, yeah. I, I I he did a good job of coming down and supporting the run. There was like one quarterback run where I thought he got there late and Gavin Wimsett got out for a 14 yard game, but otherwise I thought he was a big part of of not totally uh, neutering the quarterback run, but making it fairly ineffective coming down from his safety position. You know, had he been closer to the line of scrimmage, maybe maybe some of those are you know, one yard gains or tackles for losses instead of three or four yard gains. Um, 
So maybe. Uh, I, I do think one one thing I want to say about the running, like I, I think I said during the post game show that I thought the linebackers were missing a lot of tackles. Yeah. PFF, PFF didn't have that. And rewatching it, I guess I guess I didn't see missed tackles as much as I saw guys kind of getting caught in the wash a little bit. Okay. Um, so, and that's to, like, it's, it's happened. I thought it happened a little bit against Notre Dame and it happened in this game a little bit as well. I, I almost understand it happening against Rutgers when they're just no threat to throw the ball. So, and you like, you want to really sell out that way to stop the run. I think they just got themselves in bad position sometimes, but I do. I, yeah. I, to the point of the question, I think Sonny down closer to the line of scrimmage is better than him not being there. Yeah. And by PFF, he was, they had him in the box twice as much as deep safety. So he's oh, still, yeah. it's just, yeah. but the deep safety stuff was still more than usual. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's, it's, um, yeah, I want Sonny Styles in the mix. I don't want Sonny Styles as the last line of defense. I think everybody listening to this would agree with that because it feels like if he's in the mix, he has a chance to make a play. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jordan Hancock, sort of like some more PFF stuff here. This is Craig. Um, Jordan Hancock struggled in coverage against the slot receiver. He was getting beat all game. I'm curious what his PFF grade is on pass coverage, as I bet it's pretty poor. It's the first time I've seen him struggle right th- uh, struggle like that. It's not that bad. They only had him giving up um, two completions, Landis. And like the the one was big, right? It's the one that we talked about, uh, like a, a little slant inside and he misses the initial tackle, goes for like 35 yards. I don't know what, it, as you rewatch this, what did you think of Jordan Hancock's game? I, I only remember him giving up two, that one. And there was one where he was playing probably eight yards off the line of scrimmage. They blitzed and then the guy he was covering in the slot ran a crosser like to the other side of the field and he was sort of already in a trailing position and just couldn't, couldn't win the race there. So I think that was more scheme than it was individual skill from Jordan Hancock. Um, And then he had the one, he got beat on the double move and Gavin Wims that missed the throw down the field. Like that would have been um, catastrophic. I think had that been completed, but it wasn't so, but, but I think it's fair to count that too. So um, I thought his game was fine. Uh, You know, he, it was, I guess it was the most he's gotten beat this year, but it's only because he really hasn't gotten beat all that often. So it sticks out when it happens two or three times in a game. But I thought he was still good against the run. Obviously, he had the pick six. Um, they they blitzed him a time or two where if he didn't break, get the tackle, he, he kind of like stopped the play and then somebody else cleaned up for him. So he was still effective doing that. So I don't know. I, I still thought it was a pretty good game for him. Yeah, PFF has him six targets, two receptions for 48 yards so it's the two plays that you're talking about and again i think that the idea of um that deep shot that's everything that they've talked about all year and and like i think i've talked with jordan hancock specifically about that it's like oh what what is the thing it's like oh anything over your head is too deep right and Mm -hmm. so that was that was a time where the ball was going over his head and his man had beaten him and that was a moment and he was lucky it was gavin wimsett and not um you know caleb williams throwing that ball right but yeah. I, but i i don't know like i i've i feel like he's exactly what you want in that position and there have been times when ohio state in the last several years has sort of been searching for a slot cover guy you can rely on and i i do think he's that right don't do you think he's that yeah, I, th- I think since they, what year was that, 2020, they moved Sean Wade outside, right? Yeah. I, I think since then they've been looking for Jordan Hancock, and now they have it. Yeah, so we don't we don't want to look a gift horse here, right? Like, like yeah. the dude, it's like it's not a problem. The, I think we were even surprised. Like, the, he gets beat on the double move, and it's kind of like, oh, wow, I didn't, you know, he hasn't yeah. been beaten that way. So uh, he has a 72.5 coverage grade for the season, which is like a, on PFF, which is like a nice, solid coverage coverage grade. And you can't think of very many plays where he's actually got gotten absolutely smoked. So, oh, I yeah. moved my camera to look at... Uh, I forgot I was... <laughs> That's what was going my, on there. My head is like, what happened to Doug's head? It's like <laughs> I, my old man eyes, I adjusted my, uh, my computer screen to look at a stat. And I was like, wait. My camera's moving. Sorry, YouTube. All there right, was a play. Um, sorry to cut you off. There was a there was a play early in the game where like they motioned into a stack. Rutgers did against Jordan Hancock and Jermaine Matthews, and like Jordan Hancock communicated with Jermaine Matthews. Yes. They got figured out on which guy they were going to cover. 
They tried. I don't think it was a switch release, but they like tried to get a little pick play there. Jermaine Matthews had a deep guy covered, and Jordan Hancock had the underneath guy covered. It was like an incompletion, and it, I thought that's like teach tape on how to handle a situation like that for a guy who is become sort of an experienced veteran member of this defense and a guy who's like still learning just now learning how to play college football. I thought that was pretty good. And you could see Jordan Hancock was pointing. Yeah. Like you could see him being like, young guy, I got you. Listen to me. This is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And the young guy listened. And last year against Michigan, when they had stuff like that, they banged their heads together like coconuts and gave up a big play. Right. So uh, that is, so let's do, you wanted to maybe talk about Jermaine Matthews a little bit. I think this is the best time to do it right now. He wound up playing a stinking boatload of snaps. When you look at the defensive snaps, they had 74 defensive snaps. Davis and Igbignosen and Jordan Hancock played every single one of the 74. Sonny Styles played 73 of the 74. Tommy Eichenberg played 70. True freshman Jermaine Matthews played 69 snaps. What'd you think? So there were a couple of plays that stuck out to me from Jermaine Matthews. One was the one we just talked about. I thought he did a good job on that. First play of the game, they throw a shot at Jermaine Matthews, and I think like Rutgers fans are looking for defensive pass interference. I think the Rutgers receiver is looking for defensive pass interference, and I didn't notice this watching it in real time, but I noticed it re-watching the game earlier on Sunday. Jermaine Matthews turned his head and looked for the ball. And like he was he wasn't really in no position to make a play on the ball, but I I think a, a freshman having the wherewithal and maybe I'm giving him too much credit, but to turn your head to know that that gives you a better chance of not getting defensive mm -hmm. pass interference called against you, I thought was incredibly savvy for a, for a true freshman to do. And then there was a play later in the game, late first half um, Rutgers is moving the ball. I think the drive ends with a field goal. It was after a pass complete. Oh, here's what it was. Remember, it was like third and 10 and Rutgers is like clearly like content letting the clock run down. But then they hit a slant on third and 10 and get a first down. And like, okay, we're going to try to score now. The very next play, Ohio State is scrambling for some reason. R Rutgers is playing with a little bit of tempo. They snap the ball with like half the defense looking toward the sideline. None of the defensive linemen have their hand on the ground. And to the wide side of the field, there's nobody there but Jermaine Matthews. And they run the ball with Kyle Manungai. And Jermaine Matthews blitzes into the backfield and trips him. And he gets like two yards. And if Jermaine Matthews didn't trip him, he would have scored. There was no one on that side of the field. And it was like right place, right time, I guess. But I did not appreciate in that moment that uh, Rutgers could have taken, I think, what would have been a 13-7 to lead going into the half had Jermaine Matthews not made that play. How about that? He's not scared. He's not scared. So no. there's one thing. Sometimes, though, uh, young guys can have a little swag and then you get out there and it's like they swag themselves right out of position. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I confidently did the wrong thing. <laughs> and then oftentimes that's when we have discussions like, why aren't you playing the young guy? And then the coaches are like, well, you know, whatever. But what they really want to say is, did you watch him do the wrong thing 10 times? <laughs> so, you know, I know he's talented, but we can't be doing the wrong thing. So we're talking about a guy who's not scared. And now we're talking about situations where you bring up three things where he did the right thing. Listen to Jordan Hancock. Make sure we have the right coverage. Turn your head on a deep ball. And then when the rest of the defense is like scrambling, come up and make a play. Pretty good for a freshman, man. Not bad. Yeah, not bad. All right. That's your guy. You can have you want He's my guy. Yeah, you please. He's my guy. guy. Yeah. yeah. I can't remember. We should just draft. The four of us should just draft at the beginning of the year. So then it's, that's it. Like once and for all. So that on any show, like if Burn was like uh, Marvin Harrison, that's my guy. He's like, nope, Austin drafted him. Not your guy. You can't have <laughs> it. Cannot say that. Did we play well enough to stay number one? Asks Richard. Personally, I don't like being number one. It seems like the kiss of death for us. So actually, Ohio State's been fine with number one. The last time they were, the only other time they were number one in the playoff rankings in 19, they carried it. They were undefeated. Now they got passed at the end of the year because other teams had better wins, but they were fine with it. Um, I don't know, very reasonably, perhaps we're talking about fans who are scarred by when they ascended to number one in 2010, went to Wisconsin and had the opening kickoff return for touchdown against them. And you think like, I don't like that. I don't want to be that. We will get into this more on Kings of the North. Their resume speaks for itself. I did think that game and then when the I, I didn't think it was a good eye test day for Ohio State. No. And they also weren't helped by Notre Dame losing. Correct. 
Yeah. So we're not going to predict it here, but if the com- and the committee members watch everything, if you just sat down and watched Ohio State, and listen, I thought Missouri was going to beat Georgia for a while, and then they didn't. Missouri, like you watch the Missouri quarterback, and it's like there were times where it's like, oh man, Ohio State could use a quarterback who makes some plays like that. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm not just I'm, like Missouri had a little something, and Georgia handled it. LSU had a little something, and Bama handled it. USC has huge, gigantic holes, but they've got a little something, and Washington handled it. And then you watch Ohio State trail out the half against Rutgers, and you're like, are they really number one? And then, by the way, Michigan does what it does, which is just steamroll whoever's in their path. So I think they could eye test fall out of the number one spot, even though I think their resume remains the best resume, although it was lessened by the Notre Dame loss. Um, I think they could, I guess I don't, I don't believe they will this week. Um, but I think, I think the texter is right, to, right to ask it. Cause I, I do think they're in that position. Um, I don't, I don't think they will be number one, like a week from now. All right. This is from Robert. We complained mostly me after the game that like the game wasn't that exciting and we didn't like the broadcast. This is Robert saying, okay, what's wrong with me then? I like this game. I also like the CBS broadcast. It's better than Gus Johnson and his stupid comments. <laughs> Um, maybe he's old school. He's saying, uh, uh, great, great. Yeah. Like we were reacting to a fan who was like, I'm not having fun. And Robert's like, I'm having a great time watching Ohio state beat Rutgers. Give me more Tom McCarthy. Great. Like to each his own, man. We're here for it. Yeah. Awesome. And I hope Robert is speaking for other people who thought we were too harsh when, when I went like this. I don't uh I like the CBS broadcast. Like, you know, I like the music and I like, you know, they got the Paella. they seem to catch they seem to catch uh everything they need to catch in terms of like replays and stuff like that. I just don't like Tom McCarthy, but that's because I'm a Phillies fan and I think he's a bad baseball announcer. Uh I did watch some of uh Iowa Northwestern then on Saturday, which was on Peacock. Peacock was like missing plays again. <sighs> like they came back from a break. They had to stretch because there were sinkholes opening up on the field at Red Wrigley Field. <laughs> and as I told our texters, I think there's a real chance Ohio State at Northwestern next November is at Wrigley because Northwestern is still moving forward with the plan. They've been having all these meetings with the city council and stuff. They want to tear down that field and build a new stadium, and they want to start doing it next year. So they would not be playing there for two straight years, and so they have to go play somewhere else. So they can definitely play some games at Soldier Field. They maybe I don't know what else they can find. But they can't play in Wrigley like in September, obviously, because of baseball. And I think they can't really schedule anything for October because it's like, what if the Cubs make the playoffs? So they've played the games that they played at Wrigley in November in the past. And I think maybe their only two November home games are Ohio State and the season ending rivalry game against Illinois. And it makes me think that Ohio State at Northwestern being in November is not a coincidence. Because I think maybe people think it would be cool to get the Buckeyes in Wrigley. It would be cool, but I can also see Ohio State saying, like, no, we're not doing that. We're not standing on the same side as Northwestern and playing in a field that has the back line of the end zone up against the wall on the third baseline. Yeah. We are not running Carnell Tate into a brick wall. (laughs) Yeah. So So, I don't know. So just like if you – so I was watching it for that reason, and then I thought to myself, Peacock is incompetent. So anyway – that's sort of life uh, in the Big Ten um, this year. Did you see? Um, so we're recording this on Sunday, obviously. Uh, Alex Grant got fired. He did. Yeah. No, he did. They actually did it. They did it. Oh, they did it. that's two of the three. <laughs> that's two of the three. <laughs> Can we say that like that? That it's two of the three. Top three answers on the board. Here's the question: Name a Power Five coordinator who deserves to not have his job anymore. Buzz, Brian Ferentz, eh, already gone. Buzz, Alex Grinch, eh, already gone. One answer left, Landis. What's the answer? Let me make you say it. Is it Parker Fleming? Oh, Bill, I can't believe you said that on a show. Oh, he's a person. What's wrong with you? Yeah, uh, yeah of course. That's what it yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. One left, one left. Good for Lincoln Riley. They fell out of the top 25 in the polls on Sunday, too. Also, congratulations to Lincoln Riley for doing it too late for it to matter. 
Yeah, too right? late to exactly. try to win a national championship with Caleb Williams. Yeah. So you saw, I actually thought it was a very emotional Washington USC game, and it's great. Like Caleb, you know, they, they have a, a just an absolute tragedy with a Washington player who lost his dad um, last week and is playing the first game since his dad had passed and has a great game. He said like he his dad always wanted him to get a sack fumble and he he, he created that like just an unbelievable emotional moment with it, with that player and Kalen DeBoer after the game and then Caleb Williams is like in the stands crying with his parents because like you just you have nothing left you give everything you can and like it's not good enough because your the rest of your defense and your defensive coordinator aren't good enough so the idea that Lincoln Riley Lincoln was well no USC is not in the North so we don't say this for King of the North the idea that Lincoln Riley genius wasted Caleb Williams because he was too afraid to fire his friend Alex Grinch when he should have done it, which was in the offseason or which was any time before now, before the Washington game, which is your last gasp, malpractice. Mm -hmm. You wasted Caleb Williams because you were too nice to Alex Grinch. Malpractice. It's the French pronunciation. That's right. That's right. Last one. Scott asks, Reading some of the Michigan stuff this morning, I am sick and tired of hearing about what's fair for the Michigan players and not punishing them. What about the rest of the players in the Big Ten? What about C.J. Stroud's Heisman hopes going up in flames twice? Um, what about the chance for Ohio State or Penn State you know, to go to the Big Ten Championship each of the last two years? The assistant coaches across the country who got beat out of assistant of the year honors. They're actually my big people got fired. Um, Crimea River, Michigan. Maybe your players need to learn that decisions have consequences. So I do think... To me, the the reasonable arguments around like it's not fair to punish players or when it's like one player took money or like a, a player's like AAU coach took money and now an entire team is banned. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what is that? Like, that's nothing. A direct competitive advantage when like on the sideline things are happening. I, I think there's no argument here for that. What do you think about that? No, <clears throat> I agree. And like, to what extent the players were quote unquote in on it, I suppose is up for some debate, but you know, I, I, I can't suspend disbelief enough to think that the players didn't know what was happening. Same thing with Jim Harbaugh, same thing with this coordinators. Right. So in that way, I think they are somewhat complicit and the fact that it was a specific on field advantage, I think changes the the conversation tremendously. So I'm with the texter. I'm with you. I, I, when thinking about what, could slash should happen to Michigan because of this. I don't really take, well, don't punish the players into account. I think everyone's sort of part of it. And every player you're talking about, basically every player you're talking about, directly benefited from it if you find enough evidence to punish mm -hmm. them. So right. now they would be punished by it. So it's like, I don't, like who who's getting the short end of the stick where they're getting all punishment, no benefit. That's a very, very small amount of players. So I, I think this is... This is a situation where that apply that logic applies ninety eight percent less than it applies in almost every other situation where the NCAA in the past has penalized teams. Oh, Alex Grinch got fired. How about that? Mm. Alex Grinch got fired. He worked at Ohio State one time. He did. Does anybody know? So he he's he's from Ohio. He's, Bar he's Barry Odom's son in law. Is that right? What? He's There's someone. more nepotism. Isn't he, I have to get a nepotism chart. This is ridiculous. What if I divorce my wife? I still love her, but we just got a divorce just so I could marry into a coaching family and get a job. You think <laughs> that would work for me? I'm 50. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Gary Pinkle. Is, he's, he's not. I had that way wrong. He's not Barry Odom's son-in-law. He's Gary Pinkle's nephew. <laughs> That's close, though. Well, get Barry Odom yeah. and Gary Pinkle, both former Missouri coaches. Yes. That, You're that okay. Is, yeah, okay. Okay. But I don't think Gary Pinkle's coached anywhere. I feel That's like uh, Gary Pinkle's nephew is the name of like a underground Toledo <laughs> ska band. <laughs> Put your hands together for Gary. He said him. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna make I am gonna I'll make a nepotism chart because we have to track this so uh we can um correctly identify it and call it out. All right, that's it for the podcast daily for this Monday. We'll have a Kings in the North coming later on Monday, the live show from Roosters coming mm -hmm. later on Monday. Uh Tuesday morning podcast daily. We'll be looking ahead to like the questions that need to be asked on Tuesday, snap judgments on Tuesday, and then Ohio State plays Michigan State in prime time. 
this coming weekend, and we'll have a bunch of coverage around that. As always, thanks to you guys for making us part of your Ohio State fandom. For Bill Landis, I'm Doug Maurice, and that was the Podcast Daily.